Okay, so this is uh, my new lecture for American government on the rules. This is the rules that matter, American edition. Remember, let's remember, an institution is a set of rules, okay? So different from the people who make up a sports team or a government, uh, the, the institution, we define it as simply by the rules. Um, as an example, we can look at basketball, the evolution of American basketball. Believe it or not, way back in the day, the three-point shot did not exist. It's actually a very interesting examination of um, a particular rule and the evolution of rules and how that affects uh, games and things. But think about this, you know, 30 years ago before the three-point shot, everything was worth two points. Well, so you didn't shoot from far away very much, right? It's a lot easier to make a bucket right next to the basket. And so you would throw the ball to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Wilt Chamberlain, you know, famous big men who camped underneath the basket, and they would try to put it in. Now, when the NBA instituted the three-point line in college as well, it had a huge effect on how the game was played. It really changed the system of incentives and players, you know, now they became a whole new specialist type of player, the three-point specialist who just did that. And if you look at today's uh, NBA, almost everybody can shoot three-pointers. I mean, maybe not Anthony Davis. Well, actually, Anthony Davis can. Almost everybody can shoot three-pointers. And as a consequence, it has very, very, very strongly affected how the game gets played. I don't have time to take us through this article, but... I'll leave the slides up online, and if you want to take a slightly deeper look, you can. But here's my brief sort of summation. Um, uh, <clears throat> the main thing the three-pointer did was it forced teams to defend the entire court. So it used to be that teams would just let you take long jump shots. If you ever play pickup basketball, sometimes the guy will say, you know, go ahead, take it, giving you an open shot, and he just figures you're going to miss the shot. <laughs> They used to do that in the actual NBA. Go ahead, take it. You're 30 feet away from the basket. You know, if you make it, good for you. But I don't think you're going to make it. And then in tandem with that has been the death of the mid-range game. So it used to be if you could score, uh, you know, it used to be that uh, a lot of players would, you know, shoot from 12, 15 feet. But now you're either taking a long-range jump shot for three or an in-close dunk layup, etc. And we're even starting to see guys with basically open layups or very good looks underneath throw the ball out uh, for three-pointers. The other thing it did was it reduced the height advantage. Uh, the old game, like I said, was throw the ball into the big man, let him score. The new game uh, is, you know, throw the ball to the big guy, but hope for a double team, and then throw it outside for a three-point shot. And if you look at the way Golden State Warriors are playing basketball, you know, lots of times they just play with five guys who are between 6'3 and about 6'8, and they can all do pretty much everything, and it's just kind of like, let's move the ball and see what we can do. And in college basketball especially, it made shooting far more important than it had been in, in the past. The very same year the college game added the three-point line, Providence made a run to the Final Four based on great shooting, and the next year Indiana won based solely on shooting. So it really helped the underdog keep games competitive. Okay, so let's think about politics, right? <sighs> Excuse me. Mm, this is an early morning lecture. Um, so rules matter. Uh, rules affect behavior or rules determine outcomes is what institutionalists like to say. We are not doing nine rules anymore. We are doing six rules. I have reduced the number of rules. It'll probably take me a couple of, uh, it'll probably take me a second lecture to make it all the way through these. Um, but let's think about the sort of broad's eye view. In summation, and this is one of the things that's very frustrating about American politics, is that there's a lot, and I mean a lot, of checks and balances. Um, so there's there tends to be a lot of gridlock. Interestingly, now, of course, Republicans have all three branches of government, pretty much. 
but um, just by narrow majorities in, in the Senate and slightly bigger in the House. So they don't, you know, it's like, whew, they're right there at the razor's edge. The other thing that's different about American politics is some of our rules are a little bit goofy. The Electoral College, we already covered that. Not that many democracies have electoral colleges. The other ones that do, they don't function the same ways that are in the same way that ours does. The filibuster is another example here of a special, somewhat special, goofy rule. Okay, uh, so rule number one is electoral college, which I should have, I didn't put it there, but that's rule number one, electoral college. So look, we already did one. We're all the way up to rule number two, and it's the presidential veto. So. The veto power is the power of the president to refuse to sign a law or to veto a law that's been passed by Congress. The president does this, just doesn't happen, okay? One of the things that makes this really interesting is that presidents are actually independent to a large extent from their party. Um, if you see already some of the tensions between Trump and uh, uh, Republicans in Congress, you know, same thing with Democrats uh, under Obama. They didn't. They were a little more perhaps in line with each other, but uh, presidents and Congress don't necessarily, even if they're the same party, automatically get along. The other thing is that presidents can uh, really be um, can disagree with their party on a lot of things. They can get mavericky with it. That's a a funny joke from a presidential uh, from the presidential race a few years back between uh, McCain and Obama eight years ago now, um, and McCain Palin. They said we're mavericks. We're getting mavericky with it. So, um, and then what they were trying to say was, look, you know, we we're independent even a little bit from Republicans in Congress. The other thing that president. Oof. Excuse me. The other thing that presidents have are a very large set of authority that they can just do themselves. So think about my lecture on the president's authority um, and executive order. Presidents really can call the shots for a lot of things. And divided government is very common, so it's very common to see Congress and the president on different sides. Well, how does this affect behavior? In the first case, if the president doesn't like it, it's, it's not going to happen. Uh, secondly, the president will issue a veto threat, and then Congress usually will give up on the bill. Not always. Sometimes they will send it to him anyways, hoping that uh, to try to sort of put him on the record, so to speak. Especially if it's something that the American people want, but the president doesn't. Um... <clears throat> Uh, here's a few extra uh, uh, things for you. Um, you know, I'll have the P the PowerPoints up online, but this is just if you want to do a little bit more historical research on the veto and some of the things that have been happening, some of the tendencies that have been happening since then. Okay, so that's the presidential veto. This lecture will probably end here with uh, electoral system. This is a really important choice, okay, that all different democracies have. In the United States, we're over here on the left, the single member plurality districts, and some other places are on the right. But this choice between single member plurality and proportional representation makes a big, big difference in what happens, okay? So the basic idea is that if you, uh, for single member plurality districts, you cut the country up into a whole bunch of different geographical areas, 435 geographical areas, and in each district you have a Democrat and a Republican run against each other, and then whoever gets the most votes, even if it's less than a majority, they win, right? Notice that's what happened with Trump's presidency, he had about 48% of the total vote, uh, but he had the vote in the right places. He was even a minority winner, but he had the vote in the right places and was able to to win. So, uh, but, you know, if there's a third party in a plurality district election, lots of times the winner will have 45, 46, 47 percent of the vote. 
Um, whoever gets the most votes earns the right to represent that district. That's how that's how it works uh, there. For proportional representation, which happens in many European countries, not all of them. England does districts for the most part. France does mostly proportional representation. Uh, Mexico does some proportional representation as well. Um, in proportional representation, you don't cut the country up into a bunch of different geographical areas. You keep it all together in one big pie, and you simply throw all the votes into one big pile. What you do, though, is you don't vote for a person, you vote for a party, and the party puts together a list of, well, if we win 10 seats, it'll be the top 10 people. If we win 20 seats, it'll be the top 20 people. If we win 50 seats, it'll be the top 50 people. So depending how many votes the party gets, they'll get a certain amount of people in Congress. And then you just have this easy equation here, which is uh, uh, the percentage of votes equals the total percentage of seats. Okay, I took my uh, video away just for a second. You can still hear my voice um, so you can see the PowerPoint. So... If your party gets 20% of the votes, then you get 20% of the seats in Congress. The percentage of votes equals the percentage of seats. That's the critical thing. Over here in, in plurality districts, as we'll see in our California politics lecture, sometimes, uh, you know, you can kind of monkey with how you draw your districts and you can get it so that um, you can really favor parties by drawing districts in certain ways. But let's take a look at how single member plurality affects um, affects behavior in sing and NPR. This is really, like I said, critical critical rule. Uh, single member plurality districts drive down the number of parties who are able to compete. Why? Well, basically, in order to be able to compete in single member plurality districts, you have to be able to get it, you know a very large number of votes up around 50% to actually be competitive. And if you're, say, the Green Party, even in Europe, the Green Party wins seats, but they win, you know, 10, 12, 20% of the vote. In single member plurality districts, if you can only max out at 20% of the vote, you're not going to win anything. You literally win absolutely zero. So it's really important to, uh, you know, keep in mind how strongly uh, uh, single member plurality districts reduces, it drives down, it reduces the number of parties you have in your political democracy. It also leads to a little bit more personalistic kinds of elections where ideas matter a bit less than character. Um, you know, negative attacks really work well in plurality election, in plurality elections. Now, uh, uh, proportional representation. PR has a lot more parties, okay? There's a good poli side joke. Why is PR better than SMP? Because they have more parties. <laughs> Get it? Um, but because of that direct proportional relationship, the percentage of votes equaling the percentage of seats, right? So you get 20% of the votes, you get 20% of the seats. Because of that, smaller parties are much more viable in electoral competition, okay? And then you also get more ideological consistency amongst parties. Sometimes students are frustrated by the fact Democrats and Republicans are these big kind of coalition parties. And they really are. They're these massive, huge coalitions. Well, that's largely because of single member plurality. Okay, so you take presidentialism and your voting rule and you smash them together. And this is what you get, the two party system. Sometimes I actually start this lecture in person with, how many of you wish we had a viable third party in the United States? Everyone raises their hand. And then I say, this is why that's never going to happen. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, number two and three, when they interact, they drive down the number of parties. If you have single member uh, districts in presidentialism, you have two parties, almost no exceptions. Okay. Um, if you have a parliamentary form of governance, which we haven't covered, you can have SMP and three. And then, uh, you know, uh, PR and parliamentarism can lead to more as well. So that's uh, this, this first three rules takes you through the number.